Thank you everyone for joining us for the webinar, Creating Culture Change Through Outdoor Recreation. My name is Candace Gallagher and I am the Director of Operations and Webinar Coordinator for American Trails. This is our 84th webinar in the American Trails Advancing Trails webinar series. This special webinar is an installment in the 11-part California Trails and Greenways webinar series. The California Trails and Greenways webinar series is offered in coordination with California State Parks and the California Trails Conference Foundation with content selected from the California Trails and Greenways 2020 program. Due to the unfortunate postponement of their conference in April 2020 because of COVID-19. And this webinar series is offered free to the trails community thanks to the generous support of these supporters that are shown on this slide. Uh, we will save approximately 10 to 15 minutes for Q&A at the end of the webinar and we welcome you, uh, you to send your questions at any time during today's presentation. I am happy to introduce today's webinar presenters, which include Brent Anslinger, Outdoor Recreation Program Manager with Five Rivers Metro Parks, as well as Angela York, uh, Outdoor Recreation Special Events Coordinator with Five Rivers Metro Parks. I will now hand the controls over to Brent to get started. All right. Thank you, Candice. And I'm going to get that up here with Angela also having some control and uh, hold on a second there we go and I am excited to be able to share um, this story along with Angela and um, disappointed we weren't able to make it out to California for the Trails and Greenways conference but hopefully uh, in the future we will have that opportunity um, so it is time to talk about creating culture change throughout the recreation and um, I've had the pleasure of working on this kind of initiative and culture change effort um, since I began with Five Rivers Metro Parks in January of 2006. So we're going to go through kind of the Dayton uh, story and talk about some of that history and then end with some highlight um, conversation about our signature event, the Wagner Subaru Outdoor Experience that Angela will focus on. So um, trying to advance the slide here. Candace, I'm not sure it's a advancing like we practiced. If you need, to, you might need to click back on your slide, your PowerPoint anywhere, and then it should work. Okay. Oh, there we go. There we go. So when you look at downtown Dayton, we're located right there on the Great Miami River. So lots of opportunity to get out and recreate. Oh, still trying to advance. There we go. But in the mid 2000s, the national perspective of Dayton was bleak to say the least. And um, it was named as one of America's fastest dying cities by Forbes uh, magazine. Uh, luckily for us, that article is more than 10 years old and was kind of our, um, the old history of Dayton because what I wanna show you is how we kind of changed that national perspective. So by the late 2010s, uh, the national perspective of Dayton certainly was brightening up. So. In 2017, it was a milestone moment to be an Outside Magazine's uh, Best Towns um, edition where they said Dayton, Ohio was the best rebirth of the American dream. And that was kind of a milestone moment that culminated with a lot of the work over the preceding uh, 10 or so years where there was a focus to really change that, that dynamic that Forbes um, had highlighted um, back in the mid 2000s. And last year, National Geographic uh, said, visit America's newest adventure capital, highlighting uh, Dayton, Ohio, and specifically Five Rivers Metro Parks efforts um, uh, throughout that process. And so you can see that the Dayton story changed quite a bit over that period um, in the last 10 to 15 years. And it was really the park district um, that I work for, and Angela, Five Rivers Metro Parks was a key factor in that. They weren't the only factor in that. And there was a lot of uh, what we might say bones to the story that we were able to build upon um, that have been happening for decades. But we're gonna kind of highlight how Five Rivers Metro Parks committed itself to reinvent it, reinventing itself for a 21st century audience. So how are park users changing and how could we take advantage of that and engage them in new activities in what they might want to 
to see in their park system going forward. And so moving from that dying Rust Belt community into something that was a little more healthy, active, and vibrant. So Five Rivers Metro Parks is a conservation area agency. We were founded in 1963. And so it's about protecting the region's natural heritage. And it's about providing those outdoor experiences. So when we look at the 16,000 acres that we manage today, there is incredible opportunity to get out and hike, bike, paddle, fish, kayak, stand up paddleboard. You can, you can run the gamut a little bit through uh, what you traditionally can find in the Midwest. And that's all available right here. You see all those rivers create incredible opportunity. And we're gonna talk about those rivers and how they've influenced that, that history. So Dayton um, and Five Rivers Metro Parks have lots of opportunity, lots of green space um, to work with. When you look at our park district, we have 16,000 acres of land. 90% of that is managed in a natural state. So we have a 90-10 policy. And so when we say conservation agency, that is a utmost importance, highest priority of what we um, focus on. We don't have swimming pools, ball fields, zoos, or anything along those lines. We have trail systems, river access, mountain biking, those sorts of kind of human powered, natural, um, nature-based uh, activities. We have 160 miles of managed trails and 270 miles of river corridor, 42 of those are maintained the, um, and along our park system. That created the opportunity where we have built over time outdoor recreation specific facilities. So we call out eight specific facilities that have been built um, to, to help engage those new audiences and new ways to enjoy the outdoors and connect to nature. So it, it, when you look at Dayton, Ohio, we're, we're situated in Southwest Ohio. We're about an hour from Columbus, an hour from Cincinnati, and a couple hours from Indianapolis. So clearly this kind of shows the metropolitan area and where we rank in terms of population. Clearly Cincinnati and Columbus are much larger than the Dayton area. But we see that not as a disadvantage, but how do you look at that as an advantage? So we see Columbus and Cincinnati as clearly large metropolitan areas. Dayton's probably not gonna compete in, in some ways. We're not gonna have professional sports teams and, and other elements that go with a metropolitan area. But how do we differentiate ourselves and be something that's different? So think about what Boulder is to Denver. We want Dayton to become that to Cincinnati and Columbus. That cool mid-sized city, not too far away, where you get the amenities and some of those advantages of being near a metropolitan area, but you have that more small town community feel and that outdoor recreation um, element. When we look at kind of that framework of how Dayton has evolved over time into what we have today, which we'll, we'll highlight a, a bit coming up, the foundation for the future really started like every story in Dayton in recent times with the great 1913 flood. So this was the largest natural disaster in Ohio and it devastated the Miami Valley. So we're in the great Miami River Valley. Um, so I might, I might reference it as the Miami Valley. And so when you look at the watershed here of the great Miami River, um, it was a, a, a major flood in 1913 that Basically, the community formed the Miami Conservancy District following that so that that flood could never devastate um, the area again like it had done back in 1913. So shortly after um, the Miami Conservancy District was formed, ground was broken to build dams and levees along our multitude of uh, rivers and waterways. And those dams and levees created connected public corridors and that created opportunities for recreation. You can see this kind of vision for the future, um, but back in uh, decades ago, these similar kind of visions were coming about as you started to see the opportunities along these corridors. So when we look at visionaries, we have to talk about Horace Huffman, and he was known as the man behind the bikeway. 
So we'll talk later about the nation's largest paved trail network and, and get into that. But where did it all begin? It began with folks like Horace Huffman. He was president of Huffy, which is still headquartered in the Dayton area. He formed a bikeway committee in 1965. And that was inspired by a visit to Sacramento where he visited Sacramento. I'm not sure the reason he went to Sacramento. Maybe it was uh, for, it's a beautiful place to visit as we, uh, as we know. It, it might've been for work, but regardless, he happened to be in Sacramento at the time. They were trying to build um, some trail. They were running into challenges because they didn't have connected public land. And so land acquisition was one of their bigger challenges. He came back to Dayton and it dawned on him, our public land is already connected along these levees that were built after the 1913 flood. So he for basically formed uh, the bikeway committee. One of the nation's first regional bikeways plans was adopted in 73. And the first 8.2 miles of bikeway were built by the Miami Conservancy District in 1976. So you can see he was able to move things forward and was a great visionary for the beginning of our paved trail network. And that could just continue to build through the 80s, the 90s, and the 2000s with more and more trail sections being built and being connected. It happens, you know, continually. We're seeing sections being built out on what is now over 350 miles of connected paved trail that we uh, call the nation's largest paved trail network. This is uh, also part of the North Country National Scenic Trail right next to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base and Dayton Aviation Heritage National Historical Park sites. But that was kind of the, the early years of the early decades. And then in the mid 2000s, there was really what I like to call an intentional transition to something different, something more active that brought even more folks into the game who were maybe not given facilities or opportunities prior to that. So in the mid 2000s, the Outdoor Recreation Initiative from Five Rivers Metro Parks was formed. And there was a culmination of things that happened there. There were some things happening in Cleveland Metro Parks with the Institute for the Great Outdoors. There were benchmarking and regional things happening around some of those ideas. And there's changing park use. People weren't picnicking like they used to. They weren't going into the parks like they used to. So Five Rivers Metro Parks started to think about how can they engage the 21st century park user? And that involved more active recreation. Around that same time, uh, Greg Brummett was hired as a contractor because he had just recently written a thesis in his work at the University of Cincinnati on how outdoor recreation could be an economic driver for a Midwestern Rust Belt community. And he focused on Dayton in his thesis work. He happened to be wanting to implement some of these ideas. Five Rivers Metro Parks was looking at a way to move in this direction and kind of a, a perfect marriage was formed where Greg was hired to execute some of these ideas. Um, I was lucky enough to be the first hire of the Outdoor Recreation Initiative where Greg and I both, basically both started the same day in January, 2006. And so I've had the opportunity to kind of live out for the last 15 years, this idea of how to bring a healthy, active lifestyle into the Dayton community. Um, but a lot of it goes back to these early days and this idea of how we um, wanted to change uh, how things, um, how we were investing, how we were inviting people in to use um, facilities and how we were um, building those skills. So when we talk about creating culture, it all starts with creating access access to knowledge and skills, access to the facilities, and access to community and resources. And wrapped around all that is advocacy work. So it's about encouraging others to get involved, encouraging other agencies to, to work towards um, similar goals, to, to partner on different projects, um, there's a major Dayton Riverfront plan project right now that involves multiple partners. And so it's about bringing people together. And that's what um, we were looking to do uh, at Five Rivers Metro Parks was bring different people to the table, bring those stakeholders together to spur conversation that would lead to a healthier, active community. So 
building facilities to support independent users, teaching the skills, letting the community know these opportunities exist, and supporting the development of that active, healthy outdoor lifestyle beyond park boundaries. So one of our efforts was to not think within the park boundaries as the only place we could work to, to influence this health, healthy, active lifestyle culture, but working on different committees that might lead to more bike lanes through the streets of Dayton or the surrounding communities, bicycle advocacy, bicycle friendly designations around the region. All of those efforts help us have a healthier active lifestyle that ultimately leads to more people getting out in nature, finding our parks and being um, inspired. Telling the story, here's, a, here's our booth at the International Trail Symposium, which we have um, enjoyed supporting over, over the years. And we'll talk about um, hosting that in 2017, which was a big highlight of the Dayton plan. But Dayton, Ohio, the outdoor adventure capital of the Midwest, that became kind of a mantra of ours, and it became what we were building towards. So we may not have mountains, but that idea, that feeling you have when you go into a mountain town and you say, you just have that feeling that outdoor recreation is everywhere and it's just a cool place. So we were building that mountain town appeal in our own backyard. And these ideas, the outdoor adventure capital of the Midwest, that mountain town appeal became that kind of point on the horizon that we knew that everything we did was building towards that goal. So that was kind of the vision, the mantra. We would, I've said that term a million times in my life over the last 15 years. It's what we were building towards. Some might say, did you have that when you started saying that? I'd say, well, we had somewhat of a resume to back that up. But if I say that today, yes, we absolutely have the, back, the backing of our outdoor resume. And that's what I'm gonna go through a little bit. It was about differentiating Dayton. Like I said earlier, we sit between Columbus and Cincinnati. How can we make Dayton different and cool? How can we make someone who graduates from Ohio State choose to go and live in Dayton because it's the cool hip town near, near where his friends might still be in Columbus? We wanted to make that connection. Um, we used to talk a lot about retaining the creative class. It's about that idea, showcasing our unique amenities. And we all benefit as a region when we can develop that outdoor lifestyle culture. So this, this slide is kind of um, the slide that represents how we build people towards independent users. We don't want people to have to come to Metro Parks to take a program as the only time they can touch the water in a kayak. We want to teach them how to do it on their own. And that's what's going to build a culture that permeates the community where you can say, Wow, we used to we used to say um, we saw uh, another rack, you know, an, another rack carrying kayaks or bikes on a car, and the number of racks you saw in a summer or a given week or whatever was a sign that we wanted to see more and more of those, just like you would in that mountain town. So we wanted to see those kind of antidote um, pieces um, help us understand that we were making um, progress, and we would see that, and we do see that. But it's about outreach to the community, telling them what exists, creating those attractions. We use events as a way to engage new audiences, bring them into the fold, and then move them into engagement, whether that's taking a program, a skill-based um, program with us of how to uh, maybe learn how to fly fish or to kayak or to backpack. But that event opportunity also brings the community together where you can connect people to community clubs or retailers who can also take them down that road towards independent use. We can't serve everybody that we need to serve in order to make thousands of people ultimately adopt this lifestyle. We need to connect people to resources and let the community build upon itself. This is about the community building upon itself and that's what a culture is, right? And it ultimately leads to independence where somebody is able to independently do that activity in a safe, knowledgeable way. And that leads to the commitment of them wanting to vote for our park levies, wanting to tell their friends and family, hey, let's go out mountain biking. I just learned how to do it over at our, mount, at our local mountain biking facility that we call Mamba. So it's all cyclical and building upon itself. But how, how are we doing it? 
from the from the first day, outdoor credibility was a key factor. And this crew, you know, they look a little wild here after a big uh, event last uh, October, where 30,000 people are, came through and uh, and had a good time. Um, but this this crew is filled with extensive field experience, and they are certified outdoor professionals. So they are focused in different areas. So we have a paddle sports coordinator. We have a backcountry coordinator focused on camping and hiking. She's through like the Appalachian Trail, for example. Amy Dingle, been on the US kayak team. We have a lot of extensive experience that leads outdoor, to outdoor credibility. And outdoor credibility is where it begins, where we were, we were lucky that we had an agency, Fiber Rivers Metro Parks, that was ready to commit in the mid 2000s. And we could kind of build this idea um, from scratch in a way. Programming, like I said, it's about independent use. So we focus on areas that you can do the activity in our parks. So we don't actually have rock climbing or much conversation around rock climbing because you can't do that in Five Rivers Metro Parks. Um, there's a little bit locally, but we have focused on how to build users who can then take advantage of the facilities that are offered in Five Rivers Metro Parks. And that leads us to this list, backpacking, camping, paddling, cycling, mountain biking, and fishing is the primary things we focus on. And it's about finding the Sharon Mullins of the world who came to us with no experience and ultimately started teaching others through the local clubs and in other, uh, other ways. So she became the manifestation of this progression. You know, she worked her way up to becoming an independent user. She became confident and knowledgeable, and she started teaching others and filling in this cyclical approach. And that's the culture building that ultimately leads to changing the image and changing the feel of the community. Partnerships, working with the National Park Service on the Connect Trails to Parks grant, taking families. Um, most of these families, many had not traveled uh, to Northern Michigan to pictured rocks. Many had never camped before. And so creating these opportunities and using partnerships that help elevate that conversation. We had a goal very early on to be a regional hub for trainings and certifications. We wanted to be the place that outdoor professionals from throughout the state, the region, would come to for wilderness medicine training, to become Leave No Trace certified, to become ACA canoe uh, and kayak certified, or stand up paddleboard, League of American Bicyclists. Those are the entities we wanted to be involved with so that we could bring in either contractors or do it in house where we could train the trainer and ultimately become that regional hub where people knew, go to Dayton, they're gonna, they offer a lot of these opportunities and there's great resources and facilities to do it. So when we, can, when we teach a swift water rescue class and we have the whitewater features to do that in, that's what we were building towards. So becoming a regional hub for that, for that was important to us from the beginning. So facilities, we didn't wanna teach people how to do something and they couldn't do it in our parks. So very early on, these kind of all, all, all things, programming facilities, events, all kind of happened at the same time and evolved together over the last uh, 15 years. So mountain biking was one of those things that didn't exist in our park system. And there was limited mountain biking in the Dayton area. So one of the first things that was done was breaking ground on a mountain bike facility, which was done in uh, groundbreaking in 2006 and the opening in 2007 after extensive volunteer effort, um, eight miles of uh, trail were opened and became Mamba, our Metro Parks mountain biking area. And then Whitewater. We didn't have a lot of Whitewater in town. And so this was a project that some of the visionaries of the paddling community in the mid nineties actually started a conversation about Whitewater in Dayton. But it wasn't until uh, late in the 2000s um, where the Mad River Run came into uh, to play. And this is right next to uh, where we host the Wagner Subaru Outdoor Experience, which is our event that Angela will talk to um, in more detail. And then you move downtown. And just a few years ago, the Riverscape River Run in downtown Dayton was launched on the, on the, the Great Miami River. So basically we have three different whitewater features, two in downtown Dayton, and the one in the Mad River, just three miles upstream on the Mad River from downtown. So those three whitewater features create the opportunity for folks to actually surf 
and have uh, a lot of a good action on the waves in downtown. Shannon Thomas, who um, started a company called Surf Dayton, is highlighted a lot in some of these shots, and he teaches others now. So his company is now teaching others how to enjoy these whitewater uh, features in downtown. And clearly they make uh, a nice little uh, active spot to paddle through if you're paddling downriver. One of these locations used to be the site of a lowhead dam as well. And so through the efforts of um, private money being raised through what was called the Greater Downtown Dayton Plan, $4 million was raised and eliminated the lowhead dam, which improved the safety. It obviously helped create some uh, habitat with the uh, water churning up for the fish and, and other species. And it created the opportunity for recreation, both with the play boaters and stand-up paddleboard surfers um, and for the downriver action. So it was a win-win. And now you'll see uh, a lot more paddling and activity right in downtown Dayton. And Interstate 75, you can see the action in the river from uh, 75, which helps also change the image of Dayton when you're crossing 75 and can, can look down and see uh, that action. But it's about building community, right? So this whitewater community is starting to build and grow and we see more and more people out enjoying those features downtown. Also backpacking, you could not backpack in our parks per se until um, in 2008, we opened the Twin Valley Trail, which allowed the opportunity for you to spend the, the weekend. Um, there's three different backcountry campsites nice um, secluded uh, backcountry sites that you can uh, camp in and enjoy this network of trails between Germantown and Twin Creek Metro Park. And so there's, I think, roughly 40 miles of trail in this area. This is also one of our um, largest areas that we manage. Our 16,000 acres that we manage as Five Rivers Metro Parks, about 25% of that is down here in the Twin Valley. So it created an opportunity to create these longer hiking experiences. And uh, it's really a, a beautiful area um, that creates a, a great weekend backpacking trip and an opportunity for you to really teach skills, get out on a Friday evening, spend one night out on the trail, go back and do whatever you need to do Saturday. So having this opportunity so close to the metropolitan area is really uh, kind of a gem. I talked about this a little earlier, but the nation's largest paved trail network um, over 350 miles of connected trail. That is off street paved trail, totally connected. So we call that the Miami Valley Trails. And it is pretty extensive. Dayton is kind of the epicenter of a lot of that. So from Dayton, you can go a multitude of ways and you can ride to Cincinnati. You can ride to Columbus with only a small gap near London, Ohio. You can ride north and south up the Great Miami and along the Great Miami Riverway. So Dayton serves as kind of a, a center point to this entire network and it continues to grow. And we'll talk about um, kind of what's happened since with how that's helped us from a tourism standpoint. But when you look down at the center of this screen in Dayton, that's those original 8.2 miles that Horace Huffman helped um, initiate back in the 70s. So outdoor resume building. When we talk about out, Dayton, Ohio is the outdoor adventure capital of the Midwest. We want to have some, some designations also to back that up in addition to just the trail mileage, the river access, and those sorts of things. So when we look at what Dayton has from the touring routes that come through the area and the community designations, it's pretty, it's pretty impressive. Right in downtown Dayton, we have a national water trail. The Great Miami River Watershed National Water Trail is the only national water trail in the state of Ohio. The Great Miami River Trail, the paved trail is a national recreation trail and the North Country National Scenic Trail comes through the area on the paved trail network predominantly. The Buckeye Trail is the state trail. The Great American Rail Trail came online last year and, and, uh, and also uses the trail network to come through the area. US Bicycle Route 50, we have three rivers designated as Ohio water trails. The Ohio to Erie Trail is a uh, touring trail from Cincinnati to Columbus that goes through Xenia on the Miami Valley Trails Network. We're a bicycle friendly business. We also have two adventure cycling association routes. The newest one is the Chicago to New York City route um, and the Underground Railroad bicycle route from Mobile, Alabama to Owen Sound comes up through the area too. We're a trail town of the Buckeye North Country Trail. We're a bicycle friendly community. There's several around the area and also recently named a runner friendly community. 
when we talk about how to build a culture, some of these designations, some people might say, ah, what, do you really need the designation or whatever to, to, to say that? Well, these things on the screen, they give elected officials and other folks who are maybe less familiar with outdoor recreation or outdoor adventure, an opportunity to quickly talk about these things. It's easy now for people to say, yeah, maybe it's the mayor or someone, hey, we're a bicycle friendly community. And so it gives easy talking points and that helps spread the message. So these were certainly um, important to recruit in some ways um, and to initiate in others, um, even if you're not as an agency that you, maybe it's you as an agency or a city aren't the ones who should initiate it, but it's about initiating the conversation so they can do the application um, and helping just support everybody, creating ideas and building upon it, bringing stakeholders together. But we find these as important, but also industry events. We wanted to bring people from out of town into Dayton to see what we had and to see what was going on in the Dayton community. So recruiting the North Country Trail Association Annual Conference in 2011. And then it was an eight year project that Candace is very well aware of. The process of opening the eyes to American trails of what was going on in Dayton that, that ultimately led to hosting the International Trail Symposium in May of 2017. And so all these things help put Dayton on the map. Yes, it's important to tell the locals in Dayton about new facilities or new things going on, but it's also about creating a reputation regionally and nationally. And that's done in a variety of ways that involve reaching out beyond um, the local community. Reaching out and creating partnerships with sponsors like Subaru, who sponsor our outdoor recreation program at Five Rivers Metro Parks. All of these things add credibility and they lead to other things. So when we were able to get Subaru as a sponsor, that leads to other national manufacturers saying, well, Subaru is involved, yes, I wanna be involved. And it kind of is a vetting process. So one builds upon the other. And so that um, has been a longstanding partnership where Subaru has been involved with our program um, for over 10 years. Supporting national efforts like Rails to Trails, opening day for trails. Being involved in all those things helps build that community. And Five Rivers Metro Parks isn't alone in building upon this idea. From our partners at Wright State with the Adventure Summit, which I'll talk about in a minute, the University of Dayton Rivers Institute, to the city and the Conservancy District and the Regional Planning Commission, the Downtown Dayton Partnership had a lead role in the Greater Downtown Dayton Plan, which led to the fundraising for the Whitewater Features downtown. It all kind of builds upon itself. And once you get to a certain point, where you've told the story, you've brought stakeholders together in different projects, you start to see that message spoken back to you. So when we hear someone else say the outdoor adventure capital of the Midwest in relationship to Dayton, that is kind of when you you know you've made a difference and you've started to create that, um, that culture change. Um, a few years ago, a destination marketing organization was formed um, that Metro Parks is also a partner in called the Great Miami Riverway. And this is a 99 mile corridor up and down the Great Miami River to really promote it from a tourism standpoint, talking about the river activity, the towns themselves, the trails, the nature, and everything else you can do along the Great Miami Riverway. So I encourage you to go to the Great Miami Riverway.com and check that out. But you can see it's a, you get that level of um, professional marketing, marketing your um, outdoor amenities and everything you can do along that river. So there's Shannon surfing again, downtown Dayton. But the heartbeat of any kind of uh, outdoor culture and a good kind of uh, place to get a sense of what's going on in any town is their outdoor clubs and kind of social clubs related to outdoor adventure, but also their specialty retailers. So we're lucky to have over 50 outdoor clubs and over 50 outdoor specialty retailers that help support that culture change and that culture itself. So like I said, Five Rivers Metro Parks can't do anything on our own related to this conversation. It's about supporting and connecting dots. So we might be involved in um, connecting people to a club. So if we're at, a, at an event doing an outreach, we're able to promote someone to the fly fishing club if they're talking about fly fishing. And, and we really serve that role as that center and try to be um, that connector of the community. But telling your story, 
getting out there in the media, encouraging reporters to write about you and doing what you can to um, spread that message, to, uh, to continue to build credibility, not only within the region, but sometimes convincing the local folks themselves who grew up with some of these things. So when we say we're, we have a lot of uh, bike trails, that's great, but people, they grew up with that and didn't know any different. It was just natural that, it, of course, everybody has a bike trail near them. But when you start to say, we have the nation's largest paved trail network, and you kind of raise their awareness that this is unique and special to Dayton, that you can actually ride 30, 40, 50, 70 miles and never leave trail. And they start to then tell their cousins or neighbors or cousins or whatever from other communities that they have that in Dayton and they, they realize that other places don't have that. They start to create a, a feeling of ownership that's different than it had been. And so telling that story and and and, and um, getting locals to buy in is almost as important um, as telling the story uh, regionally to differentiate Dayton. But we try to have nice uh, professional displays to, to spread the word, getting in national publications. This was um, over 10 years ago, but it kind of highlights the Twin Valley Trail and it really leads to that credibility. Then we get into events. So when we talk about building community, it's the events that kind of bring everybody together and help generate that enthusiasm. It creates the opportunity for new folks to get involved. And so we kind of have three signature events. This is our Bike to Work Day Pancake Breakfast, which I believe is the largest Bike to Work Day event in Ohio. But if anybody has a bigger one out there, let me know. But we have about six to 700 people who come every third Friday in May to catch pancakes and enjoy it with the family. We actually have people who take off work just to come to a Bike to Work Day Pancake Breakfast, which um, is always fun. It's a great chance for us to encourage biking as alternative transportation and encourage bike commuting and to test it out on this day by coming to downtown Dayton. And our team challenges like this University of Dayton group, um, and you see the Major Taylor Cycling Club involved. Our other event, um, the Adventure Summit, partnership with Wright State University is our chance to kind of break that cabin fever, fever every other February. And we bring in national names such as Gary Fisher, or Johnny Mosley, Amy Purdy, even Grandma Joy, if you're familiar with Grandma Joy, visited us uh, this past February. We're uh, lucky to have her. But we not only bring in the national names, but it's about local folks telling their stories of adventure too. There is so many people from the Dayton area and the Miami Valley who have done anything from climbing Denali to riding their bike across America. It's giving them a format to share those stories and your neighbor from around the block telling a story about riding their bike cross country is maybe more inspiring than even the national names who you bring in. So it's about creating that opportunity to spread that message. From And the other parts of this event are competitions and expo and creating resources and really promoting that active, healthy lifestyle culture. And so at this point, I'm going to transition to Angie York, who's our special events coordinator, and she really um, makes the Wagner Subaru Outdoor Experience happen, which is our signature event every October. And it brings folks together to actually get out and do activity. So at this time, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Angie. All right, so uh, I am Angie, as Brent said, uh, responsible uh, for the Wagner Super Outdoor Experience, the Adventure Summit, and the Bike to Work Day um, event. Uh, so as the special event um, coordinator for outdoor recreation, um, the Wagner Super Outdoor Experience is kind of the, the overarching main portion of my responsibility takes a whole year to plan and a whole team and a and the full agency really to make it happen as well as a community all right brett maybe if you can just advance i guess when angie gives you the go ahead if that works <laughs> all right I'll try, I'll try to do that you can try again angie it might work for you you just did it i think i, think I just did it okay all right so uh today what i'm going to do is share with you how this event began as part of that outdoor recreation initiative to change culture in dayton and I'm gonna share how this event has evolved over its 15 years. I'll give you a little pictorial tour of the event. 
Um, and I'm going to share insights as to how we manage the content and the design to ensure that the outcome fulfills not just the agency's mission, but also supports the movement to rebranding as the outdoor adventure capital of the Midwest. And so including an outdoor festival was key in that um, initial plan and initiative to change culture in Dayton. And the reasoning for that was that uh, you know, you want a way to bring the community together. So we did here in Dayton have a couple of retailers, a whitewater retailer, some outfitters. Um, there was a small climbing area. We had those trails. So there was a small outdoor community already existing within the Dayton area. But we wanted to make sure there was a place where we could bring those people together. Uh, we wanted to showcase those local resources like our clubs and those outfitters and retailers. And we wanted to bring this all together to share and make us a, have a safe place uh, to introduce and engage new audiences to outdoor recreation. And also to bring all this energy together into one place to help build momentum for new investment and things like those facilities that Brent talked about. Okay, I'm not working anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so in the early 2000s, uh, when Dayton was going through this change that Brent mentioned, we had been known as a manufacturing town. Uh, we had um, those car manufacturers that moved out of Dayton in the early 2000s and really left the community kind of shell-shocked and, okay, what are we going to do now? And uh, as Brent mentioned, Five Rivers Metro Parks um, was, was able to focus on those riverways, those trails, those levees, um, and the opportunities that we had for outdoor recreation. And so there was a consultant that was hired uh, to help begin this initiative for outdoor recreation. And his work was based on some research he had done about how um, outdoor recreation could turn Rust Belt communities into um, vibrant economic communities and uh, places to live. And so um, events like ours was modeled after an event that this consultant had worked on as when he lived in Asheville, North Carolina. And so he was part of the development of the Asheville Mountain Sports Festival. And that is sort of where the idea and, and main structure and bones of our event came from. And back in 2005, when designing this, the thought of how to bring an event to this community, the idea was that what was centric to much, much of outdoor recreation is the gear. And so in 2005, our signature event made its first appearance as Gear Fest. And Gear Fest began as a one day event in the parking lot of our downtown Second Street Market. It's a small venue, um, but there was a lot of strategy and intentionality in the planning. We wanted to make sure that we involved our uh, local retailers and organizers. We wanted to entice out of town manufacturers to notice Dayton. We wanted to use this as an opportunity to build and forge partnerships. Um, and through those partnerships, like the ones with Subaru, as Brent mentioned, um, Wagner Subaru, which is our local Subaru dealership, was one of our exhibitors the first year at 2000, in 2005 at GearFest. And so those partnerships um, help to build buy-in and credibility within the community. And they also allowed us and gave us the leverage to solicit nationally known sponsorships. So with Subaru on board, it's easy to leverage their reputation within the outdoor community to get to other um, national brand names like Osprey or Yakima. And developing those relationships with those national brands lent credibility to our local audience. 
and it sent a message to our local audience that something was happening, something was going on in Dayton in their backyard, and it gave them buy-in um, that, that there was something special happening, and giving them this event was an opportunity for them to come together to see it happening and to really join in on that energy uh, to carry out throughout the year. And so in the, um, in the planning of GearFest, uh, you may have noticed that um, there was attention paid to the tone of the event. And so as well as when you were there, you could see the, the pools and the climbing walls, but you could also see the summit flags hanging. And so thinking about like, what are the things that make you feel like you're in an outdoor adventure place? Um, and so those summit flags, as you know, like if you're climbing Mount Everest, that's what you see there. So bringing those pieces in. And so GearFest was very successful and it began to grow just as the outdoor community in Dayton was growing. And in 2009, a conscious decision was made to evolve the event focus away from gear and towards experience. And so GearFest became the outdoor experience. At this time, we moved to a location better, that better supported this new focus. And so you can see this aerial view of the event foot footprint. Um, the event now takes place at Eastwood Metro Park, which is just three miles out of downtown Dayton. It's off a major interstate. Uh, we also took this opportunity to expand the hours to a two-day event. And um, on that overhead slide, you could see that there was uh, the river as well as flat water. There was room for ample parking, um, a larger footprint for activities. We had the ability to allow camping. That park is along that paved trail network. And it was also had the uh, ability to support an increased attendance. And so the event today is the Wagner Subaru Outdoor Experience as we've signed Wagner Subaru on as a title sponsor and they are in their fifth year as a title sponsor. Um, our purpose statement for the event, uh, and these, the purpose statement and the mission and the vision are so important to make sure that everyone on your team knows what the main thing is and that you are always um, working towards those outcomes with a, a guide, right? So using these as a guide. So our purpose was to serve an integral role for Five Rivers Metro Parks and helping <coughs> grow the outdoor community by introducing people to and building enthusiasm for active, healthy lifestyles. The mission is to bring the community together and offer ample opportunity to see, learn, and experience the recreation possibilities in Dayton and the surrounding region and connect them with their local clubs, outfitters, organizers, and other resources, and to foster their outdoor adventure lifestyle. And the vision of the Wagner Super Outdoor Experience, or as we call it, Outdoor X, is to be the premier outdoor adventure festival in the Midwest. Our key objectives is to connect people to nature. That again fulfills our mission with the agency uh, through outdoor recreation activities and cultures. These festivals we see uh, um, more so than in our programming as a way to reach new and diverse audiences because um, there's not as much of an intimidation factor. While it's a very, well, there's a very strong outdoor recreation theme to this event, it is also a festival within the community. And people like to get outdoors and they maybe are just following their favorite food truck or coming to see their favorite band. But once we have them there, they have all these opportunities to see and to try. And so we really find that this is a great way to build, uh, to bring new users into the fold. Um, we want to raise awareness of the outdoor recreation opportunities in the region because a lot of people are not aware of those. Um, a lot of people that grew up in Dayton, um, if they haven't been paying attention, may still feel like ah, there's nothing to do in Dayton and they're not aware of all these things that are going on and the facilities that have been built. We wanted to create opportunity for positive outdoor recreation experiences and again, connect people to those resources.
And our target market is really outdoor enthusiasts of all levels, abilities, and ages. Um, and by, I, you know, it's hard to even say outdoor enthusiasts because really it's everyone. And so we work really hard to focus on creating a welcoming environment. Um, we want to make it friendly for families um, and children. And but I would say that you know our Median attendance, our demographic is probably around uh, 25 to 45 year olds, and we have a lot of families as well. And so this is Eastwood Metro Park. Uh, this is where the event takes place now. This park is divided into what we call Lakeside, which is where um, the Eastwood um, Lake is that you'll see there. And this side over here is what we call park side. And so this park side area is where we host the event. And I'm gonna see since I can laser point if I can advance the slides, there we go. And so here's a close up of the park side. Um, this is the main entrance. Um, these open spaces make for great parking. This wooded area becomes a camping area. You can see the Mad River runs along here. And this here is um, what we call the lagoon, and it's a flat water reservoir. So there's a lot of opportunities within this park. And I'm just going to point out here, this is the beginning of the parking lot. And this is the paved trail network that comes through right here. And so this intersection, I just want to point out this, and this is really the boundary for the event footprint. And so looking at this map here again is that boundary line, the paved uh, parking lot, and then this trail intersection right over here that I mentioned. And so for the event planning as well as organization and how we promote it, we break the event into competitions, experiences, demos, and culture. And so for competitions, we have, uh, we host every year a 12 hour endurance run. And that run uh, goes all day Saturday and runs around the perimeter of the event. We have two fishing tournaments. We have a 5K rough run. There's a SUP downriver race, a SUP cross competition, a SUP surf competition. We have a rock the night hunt, uh, as well as raffles and giveaways and some other fun competitions. Um, as far as demos go, we have the Dock Dogs, which is a major attraction. It's right up front. People love to watch this. We have um, BMX stunt show, mountain bike trials. Here on the Mad River Run, we have professional surf shows. So we bring in professional stand-up paddleboarders and kayakers. We also have professional slackliners that come in and do slackline performance shows. And we've had, um, in the past, Frisbee dogs. And then the experiences, which is really the heart of what the event is. We call these our triads. And so we offer tricycling. People can um, get a bike from us and hop on the paved trail and ride for a bit. Uh, we have tri mountain biking. We set up a temporary skills course. We had tri rowing this past year. We do try whitewater on the, the Mad River Run on that feature. We have a pump track. We have try backpacking where you can get fitted and try on a backpack uh, with some weight on it and then go for a hike. Um, we have try slacklining. We have try paddle sports. We have try fly fishing. We have try climbing. We own our own rock climbing wall. Try fly tying. So um, we also have a disc golf course in the back of the event. We allow camping now, so you can try camping. We have a bike skills course for toddlers. We call it the Tot Track. This past year, we were able to work with the Canoe Mobile, and they came and operated on the lagoon uh, with their 10-person canoes, so people could get an opportunity to get out in those. So a family that might not be able to divide and get into a kayak or canoe was able to take advantage of those larger boats. And then the culture part, uh, and I did fail to mention, we have a youth adventure zone, and so there are triad activities for kids as well. The culture part of the event uh, is, it's a dog-friendly event, and so besides having the dog demos, we 
on the other side, these islands in the lagoon become an off-leash dog park. We have a dog activity area. We offer dog parking. So if people brought their dog, but they wanna go try whitewater, they can drop their dog off. Um, and we have an organization that watches them, uh, kind of a valet, doggy valet. We offer the camping. We have a used gear sale, which is always really popular. People can sell and buy their used gear. We offer yard games toward the back. So while people are having their food or a beverage, they can play cornhole. This past year, we um, featured a mini van life expo as uh, van life living has become more and more popular as a way for people to um, live the outdoor recreation lifestyle. We have live music on stage at all hours of the event. Um, we have a beer garden and we also offer bike parking so that since we're on the paved trail, anyone that wants to can bike into the event and then we offer secure bike parking that's uh, monitored throughout the day. And so um, I'm gonna go through some images just to give you an idea of the look and feel of the event. Some of the resources that'll be shared with you include our hype videos, and I recommend watching them because they definitely give you a really good feel of what the event is like. Um, but as I go through these pictures, I'll also be pointing out some things, um, details of how we uh, manage um, and stay focused in our design and planning, and um, as well as things that we just feel <coughs> help make the event successful. But I want to talk a little bit about the importance for us of maintaining our focus when we're designing and planning the event. And so we have a really stringent policy of human powered outdoor recreation. So when we're selecting content, exhibitors, um, sponsors, uh, athletes, uh, demo shows, we follow these guidelines to maintain the outcomes that we intend. Our focus is the human powered outdoor rec opportunities. And um, it's important for me to probably point out that uh, in some worlds, outdoor recreation may contain a multitude of things, but for our purposes and what we feel fits here in Dayton, uh, that is limited um, really to rock climbing and biking and kayaking and, um, and I guess more so doesn't include hunting for us. And so when we're choosing potential exhibitors or content, we look to those with strong focus on human powered outdoor recreation. Over the years, things have evolved so that we're not the only ones soliciting people to come to our event. Now people are applying. And so we have to review all of those applications and we say no a lot of times. Uh, if the applicant doesn't have a strong uh, focus or conjure a strong image of outdoor recreation, what we'll do is look to their website, see what that imagery brings up for us. Oftentimes someone like maybe say a big box store, uh, they might sell firearms, but they might also sell tents and kayaks. And so what we'll do with them is work with them and say, you know, we'd love to have you at the event, but because our focus is this, uh, we would need you to only bring items that meet these guidelines, which is don't bring the camo, don't bring uh, firearms. We um, also manage the appearance of the event, not just with what we do, but what the vendors bring in. So on our applications, we ask for a description of the booth, as well as pictures if they have them. Uh, and we just want to ensure again that the whole event has a very strong feel that is outdoor recreation. Um, it is a slippery slope uh, to get to just any other community festival. Um, and so we want to make sure that we are following those. And so again, uh, really sorting through your exhibitors and then also even with our sponsors. And so with our sponsors, we're a little bit looser. Um, for instance, maybe a bank wants to sponsor the event. A bank is not human powered outdoor recreation but it is also not, um, it doesn't take away. It doesn't have negative implications. 
Um, and so a bank would be something that we would consider a neutral uh, sponsor. We would not bring on a sponsor that we found was uh, felt was counter to our messaging or the image or perception that we're trying to create. And so again, just sticking to those guidelines, we've created matrices to help uh, guide us through those application um, and selection processes. But we really feel like this is important. I've benchmarked events um, that started out and uh, as outdoor recreation events. They still consider them outdoor recreation events. But when I'm there, I feel, you know, I felt like I was at a fair, uh, not necessarily the GoPro games or something like that. So we're striving for something higher and a little tighter um, and, and that we want to maintain this as an outdoor adventure festival with a strong focus on human powered outdoor recreation. And so this is the entrance to the event. Uh, it's coming people when they park, they then hop on the paved trail. Uh, they walk the paved trail network uh, alongside the lagoon over here to your left into the event. Um, and as you can see, we have all of the branding, we have custom fencing made here. And this is uh, down on the Mad River Run, which is a very vibrant and fun part of the event. Uh, these are some folks who are participating in the Tri Whitewater. And we work with local organizations to provide a lot of our content. But this one especially is important to us because since putting in these features, a lot of the community find them to be a little intimidating. And so this is a great way for people to come out and try them with some experts uh, who can give them some instruction and are there to provide guidance as they, they um, paddle through these features and learn that they can have fun. And again, this is that Mad River Run. This is a sub competition going on and uh, local organization Surf Dayton puts that on for us. Here's the crowd watching. And so I would just say to note that like when this infrastructure was built, uh, we knew that we were gonna be bringing audiences in. And so you can see the, the built-in um, concrete seating that's available there. Got some kayakers. This is probably, um, looks like our professional surf show that happens during the event. And this is uh, Stephen Wright. He is a pro athlete and a Jackson Kayak sponsored um, athlete. He was our announcer this past year. And I just bring it up because again, uh, just the importance of paying attention to the details. And while a lot of these people who are here in the audience may have never been to a kayak competition or a whitewater competition, and they may never again go, they are here today and they are getting the feel of that because we're doing it, you know, I call it the pro pro factor. So bringing in a professional um, and making the experience as authentic as possible. And again, here's a picture of that area. This is my favorite, one of my favorite parts of the event just because it's always so colorful um, and, and crowded as well. <laughs> this is a big attraction. This is our tri-paddle sports. So as I mentioned, we have the flat water area. So we have the opportunity for people to try flat water kayaking, canoeing, stand up paddle boarding. Um, this is our biggest attraction. This has a line all day long. This, we have more people come through this triad activity than any of our others. Um, and we work with the American Kayaking Association to help manage this area. And you can see there's plenty of room on the lagoon for everyone to get out and, and try something. We have an outdoor school. In the outdoor school, we work with our sponsors and exhibitors to have them provide content. Um, so uh, some of the classes that you might be able to attend at the outdoor school listed here, um, hammocking 101, my favorite, uh, but adventuring with your dogs, adventuring with your kids, map and compass. Uh, gear repair. We have Susan Marie Conrad here showing off how to um, uh, kayak camp. I mentioned that it was dog friendly and that we have the islands in the lagoon. So this is kind of some of the infrastructure that we build up. We build this 
basic mini city over the course of a week before the event. Uh, this gives us two gates that um, just like if you're going to the dog park so that we have this off-leash dog park available for those who bring their dogs. And this is not, this is only an off-leash dog park during the event. And SIXA, one of the local animal shelters, manages the whole off-leash dog park, uh, making sure there's water bowls, they have treats, they have poop bags, um, they're helping over there um, with folks and their pups. This is the Pooch parking area that I mentioned. Wagtown is an advocacy uh, group locally here. And um, like I said, you can drop your pup off while you go try whitewater or maybe just go grab something to eat. And uh, the Humane Society also provides some fun dog activities. So I mentioned we bring in professional slackliners uh, and we have a, what's called a high line that runs over the event, which is just really fun uh, because pretty much throughout the day, someone's up there walking or doing some really cool tricks. We have um, a water line for those pro slackliners that goes across the lagoon. We also have a trick line arena um, and we do um, trick line pro shows uh, and also competitions. And then this is just a fun view here from the stage. Again, you can see those summit flags carried through from, from the uh, inaugural event. But then we have our highliner. We have tri fly fishing on the lagoon as well. And again, engaging the local clubs that come help uh, do that, as well as the tri fly uh, tying. Here's that uh, the Wilderness Inquiry canoe mobile I was mentioning that helped us, uh, um, it gave us the ability to get families that couldn't separate out on the water. We have the disc golf course in the back. We have the BMX stunt riders. We have the slack line park where people can get out. You can see the slack racks in the back and then we have a couple of lines between trees and we do some workshops during the day with those pro, uh, pro slack liners offering those. And this is just a view of the paved trail going into the event and this is the camping area. So it's really close by and as you're walking into the event, you have to walk by all of this, which I feel like really just helps build that excitement and energy. Uh, we have a big fish tank that highlights the fish, fish of Ohio, and these are pulled right from uh, the Mad River a couple of days before the event. The top track I mentioned was some skills elements and the mountain biking loop. We have a pump track every year. Again, here's this cute little top track for the kids. Uh, we have a mountain bike trials rider that comes and does uh, stunt shows. And I'm gonna mention here, you can see this is an audience member. So obviously he's signed a waiver. And one thing that we feel is important is a one waiver system. So we try to, we work with all of our providers, whether it's the professional athletes or um, some of the triad providers that we only use one waiver. So when people come into the event, they sign one waiver and get a wristband and all the providers know to look for that wristband. We work with those vendors um, months and months ahead of time to make sure their legal approves our waiver for them. But we feel like this makes things more streamlined for our uh, attendees rather than them having to sign waivers at every station that they were to go to. Um, and then it's really important besides some of those things that you just have some fun, right? Uh, so we have the yard games, as I mentioned, we always have some hula hoops. Uh, we've done some fun like uh, little kitty bike competitions. Uh, these are our um, exhibitors. So, you know, we have a gentleman from Osprey and one of our retailer, the owner of one of our retailers uh, competing against one another. And it is important to make sure that, that everyone at your event has fun. So not just the attendees, you wanna make sure your exhibitors have fun because they're gonna go back. A lot of them are might, might be local reps and you wanna make sure that they report back. Yeah, that was a great event. And we wanna go back next year. And you want them to report back, not based on their sales, but based on their experience. 
And so um, you just, you know, find ways that you can engage them and give the exhibitors an opportunity to have fun as well. And one thing we've done there is uh, we decided to change our exhibitor hours and we allowed the exhibitors to start closing early. Um, people weren't shopping late anyway, they were mostly hanging out by the stage. And so this gave the exhibitors an opportunity to close shop. We had to bring in extra security, but by allowing those exhibitors to come off the clock, uh, grab uh, you know, a beverage and go hang out in front of the stage and have fun and network with one another, we felt like was really important because they're gonna go around. These reps uh, for national brands are gonna talk about this event in Dayton, Ohio in a very positive way and how, what a great time they had. Uh, this is just one of the fun competitions uh, that one of our local retailers helped with. And again, looking to your exhibitors and sponsors uh, to help provide content so you're not doing it all. You want to make sure you have places uh, to, that people can hang out. Uh, this is um, an evolution of, it's called the club. It started as a way for us to highlight the clubs in the region. So we called it the club. Uh, but we have uh, Adirondack chairs scattered about. Uh, this past year, we brought in hay bales to make seating. Um, and then you can just lay on the ground too if you want. <laughs> and then just to make note, I know it might look like, wow, you guys have everything you need at that park, and we do, and we're super lucky, um, and we're so lucky to have an agency that fully supports us and our mission with this event, and the whole agency comes together to put this event on. But I do want to say that we haven't always had that. And so if you don't have it, you can build it. In the early days, uh, we had to build our own fly casting pond. So this is the fly casting pond that we built. We didn't have the whitewater feature, so we had to bring in a portable pool. So you can always think outside the box of how you can bring some of these things uh, to your event. Um, we run this event uh, with uh, attendance last year over 25,000 waste free. This started in 2012 by eliminating single use water bottles. Uh, we kept this on, it was a waste, three, waste free and three initiative that has continued. Um, every year we implemented steps to the point where we are now um, at 80% diversion from the landfill. So in 2015, we started measuring the waste. Uh, we started having our waste stations managed so that we can control. And so uh, the waste stations are set up and they're ran by volunteers. People come up and they make an attempt at sorting their stuff between compost, recycling, and landfill. But then we have the volunteers in the back to ensure that the, um, the waste goes in the appropriate receptacle. And um, we have a goal of a 90% diversion from the landfill. For three years, we were pretty much running consistent and we took a deep look and realized that outside waste was a contributing factor. So um, people were coming off the exit of the highway, swinging through a fast food restaurant, walking into the event with their styrofoam cup, and then putting it in our waste. So it wasn't event waste, but it was coming into our waste stream. And so this past year, we made the extra effort um, to separate out outside waste. And that brought our diversion up to 85%. And so we're really proud of this, and it's a very, I will say we've learned a lot through the years um, and it has the potential to be difficult because you're working with a lot of food vendors and what we do with our food vendors is we manage the serviceware that they use so that we know all the serviceware is gonna be compostable. And we have language in our contracts with even our exhibitors uh, to make sure that if they're bringing giveaways that they're not, um, that there's no waste involved with those. And so, um, again, the waste-free portion of the event is something I'm really proud of. And one of the things I love doing is, is letting people know that, yeah, we have almost a thousand pounds of waste from the event that ends up back in our metro parks because we have our own industrial composter. So post-event, all that composting 
um, which is the majority of the waste from the event, uh, comes out and uh, ends up back in our parks. And again, there's that three-step approach that we've perfected, and I am speeding up because I know we're, we're running out of time, uh, but this is what that waste station looks like uh, when folks come up. Again, manned by our volunteers. And this waste-free initiative was recognized by the Ohio Parks and Recreation in 2018, and we won uh, an award in the environmental um, uh, category. And then it takes over 200 volunteers for this uh, event to happen. And so it's really, really, really important to take care of your volunteers. Uh, so many volunteer hours go into this. They help us build that city the week before. They help us the week after tearing down. They're running so many major components of the event. I feel that it's important you know, to say, take care of your, your volunteers. And our volunteers love Whole Foods. And so um, we've been fortunate enough to be able to have Whole Foods as a provider for our volunteer meals um, for a few years. We give the volunteers a place away from the hubbub and chaos, uh, I shouldn't say chaos, but excitement and high energy of the event. We give them a little place for reprise where they can come back and grab a cool drink, uh, a bite to eat, sit in the shade and just kind of relax. There again is that spread from Whole Foods that really does like bring volunteers to sign up. Uh, and then um, I just wanted to make a note on some of the details, right? The little things that make a difference, uh, ensuring like we use uh, custom branded flagging. You can see in this post, we have the custom branded flagging, but our race tape matches using that same color. We have these custom fences that were printed that um, serve as boundary dividers for the different zones of the event. We've created our own barricades so that they're on brand. Um, you can see those there. Uh, old equipment, don't throw it out. You can use it as decoration. We decorate the stage, uh, you know, the entrances to the different zones. Uh, and also thinking about looking up. So we decorate in the trees uh, hanging kayaks, which is just really cool. Um, it's like the kayak Christmas tree. And so just to really quickly show you attendance in the first year, uh, Gear Fest was 2000, uh, looking now to this past year at over 25,000. And this is over two days, that was one day. Some of our numbers, we have a lot of uh, people camping, 500 campers, uh, over 5,000 people that signed waivers. So we know that those are the people that are um, trying the activities. Uh, 78 exhibitors in 2018, uh, 92 exhibitors in 2019. The activity and camper numbers stayed about the same. And to just kind of bring this all back and summarize, uh, it's really important for us to make sure everyone has fun, right? We want uh, the, the gentleman who's here from Osprey, he's going all over the country and representing Osprey. We want him saying, oh my God, I was in Dayton, Ohio and I had the best time at this amazing festival. I can't believe what they have going on. So not just your attendees, but making sure your volunteers and your exhibitors have a great time. Working with our stakeholders throughout the year, I'm working with our retailers after the event, uh, in the months planning the event, finding out what their thoughts were, what their observations were, uh, if they have ideas uh, for new or new content or um, activities. Don't do it yourself because you have a community, hopefully like we do, where you can have your exhibitors, sponsors um, provide content or manage content for you. And then really staying true and adhering to those guidelines, making sure you know who you wanna be, what you want the event to look like, and then making sure you take the steps to ensure that. And again, that means no, I have a whole file of the people I've said no to. And keep it the same but different. That was the last point on there, which is our event is the same every year. It's the same activities, like no, new human powered act, outdoor recreation activities aren't being invented every year. And so the event 
in general is the same, but what we do is work on small tweaks with the layout um, and just changing things up enough so that people don't think that, oh yeah, I've been there, done that. Again, a uh, summary of choosing wisely, um, making sure that uh, they fit your guidelines, uh, having a lot of intentionality uh, when you're planning. And for us, you know, we practice that to maintain the event's credibility, uh, the image and the reputation as the premier outdoor adventure festival in the Midwest. And I talked about that earlier, but just, um, you know, sorting through applications for vendors and our sponsors, and then thinking about that big picture, knowing that you're gonna recognize your sponsors in multiple places. So if you have 20 sponsors and 17 of them are banks and only three of them are outdoor rec, when people see your sponsor banner, they're not gonna get an overwhelming sense of outdoor recreation. And again, we're fortunate with an agency that fully supports us that we can kind of pick and choose to, to maintain that um, path. So making sure for us that there's an overwhelming majority of sponsors that are in the reinforcing category and that the majority of our vendors strongly reinforce our brand. And so we might have a vendor that doesn't strongly reinforce our brand, but they do, they, are, they have a human powered um, connection but what we might say is that we're gonna strategically place them within the footprint of the event, and we might, um, we might not allow them to maybe say buy nine booth spaces because that's too much of an overwhelming uh, piece of the event. And the big picture is that we want people to come and feel like they're at an outdoor adventure festival and not just another community festival. We want them to come and experience uh, so that, you know, my favorite thing is when I talk to people who say, oh my God, I was at Outdoor uh, X and I tried kayaking and I just loved it and I went and bought a kayak. Because when I hear those stories, I know that, that we're doing what we set out to do and it just makes me really happy. And so there's the event crew at the end of this past year's uh, event. And I'm sure we're all tired because we work really hard the week before so thanks angie it does take a community to bring everybody together and to help build the outdoor adventure capital of the midwest so i know we went a few minutes over but uh we'll try to answer questions on the word our, our post program and the format that candace will provide and i'll turn it back over to candace Oh, well, thank you so much, Angie and Brent. Such a, a great presentation. I know a lot of stuff to be covered. So I, I appreciate those who have hung on. Um, we'll go for another, you know, five or so minutes. I know that we are already over time, but we do have some great questions that came in. And if anyone still wants to ask questions, if we don't get to it during the live Q&A, I will follow up with the presenters to see if they're able to answer them in writing, uh, which I will send out to the attendees as well as post on this webinar's web page via the link that um, is at the top of this page and everyone will get this resources slide that you currently see in my follow-up email along with the link to the recording and the closed caption transcript so we'll ask the first question um, the question comes from alice how was and is diversity, equity, and inclusion considered when designing the initiative? Were diverse voices included in determining what spaces and experiences were uh, that were created? Um, I would say that's always a work in progress. It was certainly um, part of the conversation early on, but it's something where you look back and you say, we certainly could have done better in those areas. But we're... Um, as you saw with that kind of one programming outing to Pictured Rocks National Lakeshore, working with some of our underserved audiences for certain aspects of, of that program, but it's certainly certainly an area we want to improve on. And you can see our events, we maintain free and open access to the events as part of a chance for that to be an inclusive, inclusive area in terms of uh, everybody getting involved. So um, we do need to focus on that more, but have, had some successes in the past as well. Amanda asks, how do you think this would work if events were dispersed at different locations or parks around town? 
you know, we we had a, a, a thought early on what would happen if it was over the course of a, a week and there was kind of a central landing spot similar to maybe an Olympics venue type of thing. I think it it's all about the community. Um, there's certainly different logistics and resources with that model. Maybe if it was competition spread out over town, but then there was a central place that was the main festival area. We've had great success in our model. And so we haven't evolved into that where we spread around town. Our success is bringing everybody together at the same place at the same time. And so for us, that works. I don't know that it's um, gonna work perfect for everybody. And maybe that spread around town model makes sense. We're lucky that we have the flat water option, the white water at the river run, the space for camping all in one location. And so that makes kind of a perfect mix for us at where we where we do the event. But um, certainly uh, it could work in different ways. A few people are asking about funding sources for Five Rivers Metro Parks. So our, we're lucky that we have uh, uh, the support of the community who um, most recently passed um, our parks levy um, two years ago now. And so that's a 10 year levy. So it's a property tax levy. And so in Ohio, just like many states, there's the opportunity for um, these special districts of which we are one. So we are lucky that we've had the support of the community who continue to uh, support us with um, voting for our levy. That puts us in um, you know, a pretty good situation in terms of we have a single mission to protect the region's natural heritage and pr provide outdoor experiences that connect people to nature. And so our, um, our funding is focused on that mission. And so we're not in a place where today in the midst of COVID-19, we're debating on whether to keep parks open or provide trash services or those sorts of things. Um, that's part of the uniqueness of being in a state that has special park districts that are levy supported in that way, that we have that single, um, single focus. And so that does put us in a place where um, we have a little more uh, comfort in that way and the, the choices we make. And we have an agency that sees the value in an event to bring um, new audiences to the table. And so by having it be a free and open access event, that's back to the equity question, we're able to introduce people to their parks and to new activities within those parks. And so it all kind of brings it, um, brings it around to that concept. Susan asks, how do you balance attracting users with the need to protect the resource, whether it's access to a river containing endangered species, to a very, or to very popular trails, or to rel uh, relatively small city parks? So that goes a little bit back towards the root of who we are as an agency, as a conservation agency. So we're lucky to have wildlife biologists and other conservation kind of experts on our team as an agency. And so there are full evaluations before any new river access is put in or or any sort of uh, a trail is built and so we rely on those experts within our agency to help guide those um, decisions um, and we're very cognizant of um, being aware as five rivers and Met metro parks of putting the public in places where they're not going to do damage so i guess it's all wrapped around that kind of core of who we are as an agency and we try to live that out in everything we do, you saw that in our waste-free efforts with the event, trying to show that conservation effort and um, show that it can be done as a role model to others in the region and, and around the nation that it may be a hard work, but it's worth it in the end. So that conservation message kind of overlies everything we do. All right, we'll ask one more question. Um, Mary says, we are located in a great outdoor area, but finding funds to create the trails is very difficult with a budget of a community of 296 people. Any suggestions? I don't know that I have great suggestions other than continue to talk to people, bring stakeholders together and keep the conversation alive. I think perseverance is, is um, maybe the, the word that comes to mind in those situations. I'm not an expert on funding sources for trail projects. That's, that's our planning and projects area. So I think it's more about creating those conversations, using those resources and bring, bringing the, having a champion and a visionary is a key. And the rest, if it's a good idea, will follow. And those, those, those elements will come into play. But plugging away at it is important. 
Great. Well, thank you so much, Brett and Angie, for your time. And thank you for the attendees and those interested in this webinar topic. Um, and thank you again for joining us for this installment of the California Trails and Greenways webinar series. Be sure to check out our website for the rest of their webinars going through mid-August, all of which are free to the public, thanks to their generous supporters. And we hope you'll be able to join us for future webinars offered in our Advancing Trails webinar series. I noted immediate upcoming webinars on this slide. If you uh, miss any of our live webinars, they are available as recordings to download at any time in our online store. Thank you again to everyone uh, for attending. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and happy trails.